Vale, pues pasamos a la, a la conferencia que cierra el día de hoy. Eh, tenemos a Lea Temper. Lea es investigadora, es activista, especializada en economía ecológica y en ecología política. También es videoartista. Es fundadora del Atlas Global de la Justicia Ambiental y muchísimas cosas más. Nos va a hablar de conflictos socioecológicos que trabaja en la Universidad de Barcelona con la gente de John Martínez Zalier. Y bueno, Lea, te dejo y todo tuyo. Buenos días, muchísimas gracias. Y hoy voy a hablar en inglés, así que espero que todos puedan seguir. Uh, las preguntas al final les puedo tomar en, en castellano. So, uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much for the invitation to Miriam, Yolanda, Emilio, and Pablo. And um, today uh, we're here to talk about um, ecological limits. And uh, thank you so much to the previous two speakers who uh, spoke a lot about uh, resource scarcities of uh, oil and fossil fuels and minerals, because even though I'm an ecological economist, I'm not actually going to speak about uh, ecological limits today. I'm actually going to talk about uh, social limits and social conflicts related to the environment as a result of economic growth. So the name of the talk is uh, History of Global Socio-Metabolic Pathology Seen from Socio-Ecological Conflicts. And I'm going to uh, talk, uh, the, the talk will have three parts. In the first part, I'm going to introduce some of the concepts. Some of them we've heard a bit of before, social metabolism, uh, metabolic rift, environmental justice, and I'll talk about the types of conflicts that we've been mapping in the map of environmental justice. In the second part of the uh, talk comes the bad news. We'll talk about the, uh, the green economy and why it's a false solution to the ecological crisis. And um, my talk will have some good news. So in the third part, I'm going to talk about resistance as resurgence. And I'm going to give some examples of alternatives and resistances and showing that they are putting forward some positive paths to dealing with this crisis. <clears throat> so uh, the bet. The famous bet between uh, Julian Simon and Paul Ehrlich. I'm not sure if anyone, has, anyone here has uh, ever heard of it. It's perhaps uh, the most famous uh, scientific bet ever wagered. Uh, Paul Ehrlich is a biologist, and he was one of the original writers of the uh, Limits to Growth report in 1970. And he also wrote a book called uh, The Population Bomb. While you are reading these words, four people will have died from starvation, most of them children. Uh, Julian Simon is uh, what they call a cornucopian. So he wrote the book uh, The Ultimate Resource, where he argues that uh, everything is improving, pollution is decreasing, and natural resources and energy are getting less scarce. So in the year 1980, uh, Julian Simon said to Paul Ehrlich, let's make a bet. You pick uh, five minerals or five resources, and I bet you that in 10 years time, or you pick the date, uh, the price of these resources is going to decrease over time. And this proves that there are no ecological scarcities. So question, who won the bet? Who do you think won the bet? Indeed, on uh, October 1990, 10 years later, uh, Simon opened up his mailbox and there was a check from Paul Ehrlich in the mail for about uh, $576. Because the price of every single one of those five commodities, I think it included uh, copper, tin, tungsten, and other metals, uh, as we've been talking about today, the price of every single one of those five commodities had decreased. So, how are we supposed to understand this? 
And um, the impact of this bet, actually, uh, this bet has been used ever since then by neoclassical economists to prove that the environmentalists were wrong. There's no limits to growth. It's been proven through this bet. And, uh, you know, economic growth can continue forever. So suffice it to say, uh, it was a problematic bet. So what can we learn? Well, first of all, uh, don't make this sort of bet that you can't afford to lose. And you're, you know, betting for more people than yourselves. Uh, I think the second takeaway is that prices do not represent real scarcity. The prices are, uh, you know, very arbitrary. They're not actually based on supply and demand. Uh, so, and they certainly don't take into account uh, ecological impacts, as uh, you were just mentioning in the case of uh, resource extraction in Colombia. The second takeaway message, and this is a uh, goes slightly counter to what the previous two speakers would say, is that we may be seeing that uh, scarcities about sinks are more important today than scarcities over sources. So sources are the resources that come into the economy, and sinks is the air, water, soil that absorbs the pollution. And as we see with climate change, we're reaching limits of absorption, and that's the sink capacity of the planet. But for me, I think one of the uh, most popular takeaway messages is that we don't need to talk about and wager on future ecological devastation. There's actually the horrors of capitalism and ecological crises can be witnessed very easily today. And, um, so this is the project that I've been engaged in for the past five years. It's called the Global Atlas of Environmental Justice. And uh, until today, we have uh, mapped 2,100 different cases of ecological conflict and environmental injustice. So each point on this map uh, represents some sort of conflict over resource extraction, or waste disposal, and it shows that in all of these places there are communities that are standing up and resisting and saying, we refuse to be polluted. Um, and the people at the front lines of these struggles are normally not environmentalists. They're uh, people that are defending their own livelihoods. Joan Martinez Allier calls them the environmentalists of the poor, even though they're not all poor. Uh, it could be, you know, people like you and me. There's really a, a wide variety. And we have cases here, uh, about 600 cases of land grabbing, land dispossession. We have almost 400 cases of mining conflicts, uh, over 200 of oil and gas exploration. Um, and... What this atlas shows also is that there are huge inequalities in how environmental devastation is experienced. So we say in environmental justice terms that pollution is not democratic and pollution is not colorblind. Uh, some people are polluted uh, while others are not. And this is uh, one of the original studies from the US the environmental justice movement was trying to prove environmental racism. And they started doing this type of maps that showed uh, black communities. The blue represents the percentage of the community that's black, whereas the little red dots represent hazardous waste facilities. So we can see already that these types of hazardous locations are concentrated where we have uh, minorities, uh, racial minorities, ethnic groups, and poor people. And we see this same phenomena in the atlas. Actually, in the atlas, I think around 40% of the uh, cases that we've documented involve indigenous populations. And the, uh, the previous speakers have spoken a little bit about this idea of social metabolism. 
and that's the concept of how the society and the economy interacts with the natural system, how it absorbs energy and materials, and how those energy and materials are later expended as waste and as heat from the economy. And as we see, as the economy grows, it uh, occupies more and more natural space. And uh, this leads to what we call the expansion of the commodity frontiers. So the expansion of the commodity frontiers happens in different ways. It happens that we have to go deeper and deeper into the oceans to find uh, oil and gas and all of these uh, explorations come with new technologies, which means new risks that we, uh, we're not aware of. Also, as the economy expands to find the new materials, it has to go increasingly to more remote areas. So this is why we are increasingly encroaching into the lands of indigen indigenous populations. And um, it also, these new commodity frontiers, what they do is create new commodities. So water becomes a commodity. Environmental services become a commodity. So we're constantly creating also new commodities and that is the expansion of the commodity frontiers. And as the commodity frontiers expand, uh, what happens is that we become more and more disconnected from nature. So we don't really see anymore the impacts of our consumption practices. And um, this is a concept that, uh, it's not a new concept. There's uh, Karl Marx actually talked about something that we call today the metabolic rift. So uh, what is the metabolic rift? Back then, uh, Marx in Capital, he says that uh, England was appropriating the soil fertility of Ireland's soil because Ireland was exporting a lot of food and fiber to the new industrial cities in England. And uh, the nutrients that were contained in the soil and in the food were exported, and these are the nutrients we were talking about previously, phosphorus, uh, nitrogen, and potassium. potassium. These nutrients are expor exported, but they don't return to the soil. Uh, and what are these nutrients? They come, of course, I mean, they're <laughs> excreted in the form of human waste. And uh, you can see here, these are some photos actually of the uh, collection of night soil. And night soil is human wastes that up until a certain point were actually collected in big cities such as London and then sent back to the rural countryside to replenish the soil fertility. So this uh, concept of the metabolic rift shows this increasing disconnection. It's the disconnection between the city and the country, and it represents the disconnection between man and nature. And this concept can be expanded to many different types of uh, ecological conflicts and issues that we see today. And I'll just skip a couple of examples. So we were actually uh, just talking about this case, which is uh, phosphate. As uh, Alicia mentioned, phosphate, it can't be fixed, it can't be synthesized like nitrogen. So uh, there's fixed amounts. And in this case, actually 75% of, uh, approximately 75% of the phosphate reserves are located in the territory of uh, occupied Western Sahara. So that's uh, some food for thought. Next time you're on the toilet, it's very likely that your pee or urine has phosphate in it from Western Sahara. <laughs> um, and just this is uh, just to be quite actual. Just last week, uh, several ships uh, carrying phosphate from Western Sahara to Canada were uh, detained. One of them was detained in Panama. 
Another one was detained in South Africa. Uh, disclaimer, I'm Canadian, so you'll notice that there's Canada will come up a few times and not in a very positive light in this, uh, in this presentation because Canada is one of uh, the companies, one of the countries that has several companies exploiting these phosphate reserves. But uh, the European Court of Justice has ruled recently that actually this uh, resource exploitation is completely illegal. Morocco does not have jurisdiction over the Western Sahara, which is a sovereign country. And um, I'll just share with you one quote from the leader of the, uh, one of the members of the Frente Polisario from the Sahrawi independence movement. He says, we can no longer tolerate the myth that the mining and export of phosphate rock was somehow a benefit to our people under occupation inside Western Sahara. Our people in the refugee camps haven't seen anything from this trade. Consider this, a high quality phosphate rock for agricultural fertilizer is sold at a profit and benefits the nutrition of children in countries such as Canada and New Zealand. Meanwhile, the rightful owners of the resource, including Sahrawi children, face poor se food security in refugee camps. The injustice of this situation could not be more apparent. And um, even in Canada in the States, uh, the over-application of phosphite and fertilizers is actually causing a huge environmental devastation uh, to the Great Lakes, for example, which is leading to eutrophication and it's killing the lakes. So this is uh, obviously a very apt example of this metabolic rift today. And of course, um, the most uh, impressive example of the metabolic rift is uh, climate change. And uh, here we can see on the top, you see the uh, per capita emissions per country. And then at the bottom, you see a graphing of the countries that will be most impacted by, by climate change. And you can note that it's almost a sort of mirror image of one another. And of course, the same, uh, the same dynamic happens within the countries themselves. So within the countries, of course, you have certain communities and neighborhoods which are more impacted and others who are less. And this kind of occurs fractally, the south and the north, the north and the south, so on and so forth. So part two, false solutions. Uh, this is... Uh, a painting by an uh, indigenous artist that I, I like very much. And it's called Red Man Watching White Man Trying to Fix Hole in Sky. And we see that um, you see kind of these two scientists perched precariously there trying to patch the sky. Uh, the indigenous man is looking on. And then in the background, you also see the mountain that is animated, very much alive. The earth is very much alive. And the mountain is crying out in pain. And uh, the scientists are completely oblivious to, to, uh, to these cries of the earth. So uh, this is, I think, a very this surreal image is obviously a very apt metaphor for how us as scientists, how mainstream society, how uh, corporate actors and elites are trying to solve the ecological crisis. And uh, as you mentioned, we often talk about the green economy. Um, and the green economy, it sounds nice. It sounds like, oh, this will be this uh, green future, and everything, you know, it will be win, win, win. Um, but of course, uh, the reality is, is not so rosy. And um, what the green economy actually intends or makes us think is that we can continue the same patterns of consumption 
and uh, the costs can be displaced elsewhere. Or that, um, you know, by creating new wealth through commodifying nature, if we just put prices on nature, then that will solve the, that will solve the ecological crisis. So that's the main approach of the green economy. And of course, you see here that there's been a lot of resistance to this idea of the green economy and the increasing commodification of nature. And I'll just share with you a few examples and a few stories of what this looks like. So, uh, oh, and this is a shot in the atlas. We have about... Um, 433 conflicts that are documented that we could say are related to this so-called green economy. And they include conflicts over renewable energies, uh, conflicts over biofuels, conflicts over CDM projects and carbon offsetting. So uh, I invite you, of course, to explore a little bit what some of these conflicts are. And it's interesting to see because these are uh, emerging conflicts that really show us some of the social constraints to this shift to a green economy. So, um, one, one, uh, one initiative has been called RED. I don't know if anybody's heard of it. It's reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation. And the way it works is this, is that if I want to fly to London for that concert, uh, that we mentioned previously. Then uh, when I'm buying my ticket, my plane ticket, it might give me the option to say, would you like to offset uh, part of this flight so that you can reduce your guilt about flying to London? And I might say, sure, that sounds good. You know, I'm going to store this carbon elsewhere. And where is the carbon being stored? Well, often it's being stored in this type of projects. And this project, for example, it's, um, it takes place, uh, it's in uh, the uh, state of Acre in Brazil. It covers 35,000 acres. And in those 35,000 acres, there's 18 families that live there. And they live through small scale agroforestry activities. So that's their livelihood. And um, the company has come and said, oh, these, these 18 families are deforesting the, the forest. And uh, we are going to, we're going to stop them and restrict their livelihood activities so we can store the carbon. And uh, the community in this case has said, we didn't actually sign up for this project. Uh, the money they're offering us doesn't actually compensate for our lost livelihood. And we were tricked into signing over the rights to our land. So this type of red project is just a way for people to continue polluting and then to occupy more and more environmental space in the south and from poor populations. And uh, this project has actually, even though it hasn't... Uh, I, as I know yet, actually prove that they've stored any carbon. It has already sold credits to uh, people coming to the 2014 World Cup in Brazil. Um, <clears throat> so we also have uh, numerous conflicts in the atlas related to renewable energy projects. And this includes uh, windmill projects. Of course, uh, dams are super problematic, so we won't even get into that at this point. But uh, the problem with most of these renewable energy projects is that they're just replicating the same industrial mega model of energy and displacing the costs onto poor populations. So we see uh, several cases in the Atlas where indigenous populations are being dispossessed for this sort of uh, large-scale renewable energy projects. Here's one example in uh, Lake Turkana in Kenya, where pastoralists are having their uh, roots uh, where they graze their cattle disrupted. And of course, since they're pastoralists, they don't really, can't really claim ownership of the land. Uh, there's other cases, for example, in Oaxaca, Mexico, in the Tehuantepec Isthmus, 
Uh, it's a very windy corridor, so there's been a numerous uh, wind energy projects there at a mega, mega scale. And uh, the community has been resisting, but they're not only resisting, they're also saying, we want another energy model. We want to do community wind farm projects. We want to have energy sovereignty and energy democracy. So uh, it's not only about the technology itself, it's more about the social organization behind the technologies that are often more important. And then uh, back to Canada uh, for this third example, which is uh, kind of the scariest techno fix of all, which is large scale geoengineering. And uh, geoengineering is kind of this large scale experimentation in reducing uh, climate change, either through solar radiation or other ways to uh, absorb the carbon. And actually, uh, there's quite a lot of research into this, but uh, these types of experiments are already happening. And this is one case where uh, what they call a rogue geoengineer made a deal with an indigenous community in Canada. And he told them, oh, well, if you come into partnership with me, uh, you know, we can do this test. It might uh, restore the wild salmon runs in your community because that's their livelihood. And also you're going to get carbon credits from uh, this, this plan. And this entailed dumping about 100 tons of iron sulfate into the ocean in order to uh, produce um, algal blooms, plankton blooms, with the hope that this would absorb carbon. Of course, this is uh, completely illegal. It's against the UN Convention of uh, the UN Convention of Biological Diversity. It's against other conventions about dumping at sea. But uh, so far, actually, Canada has not taken any actions against uh, the people that did this test. This happened in in 2012. So this type of um, experimentation obviously carries in uh, huge risks and we have no idea what the impacts could be. This is kind of techno experimentation, uh, the crazy climate techno fix at a global scale. But now we come uh, to the good news. <laughs> and um, the good news is, well, firstly, that um, there are alternatives that are being proposed, many of them from the ground up by the communities that are actually resisting these types of projects. And we have a, a new research project that's specifically looking at these resistances and their, how they are actually uh, leading to processes of social transformation. And the other good news is the fact that people are actually standing up and resisting altogether and saying, uh, I'm, I'm not willing to be polluted anymore, which is already some sign towards social change. And you have to think that every single one of these resistances, uh, they leads to social costs and social impacts for the companies that are exploiting these minerals. And uh, it's actually making this type of exploitation more difficult and more expensive and hopefully, hopefully leading to this societal transformation that we're talking about here. So, uh, how many minutes left do I have? Because I have a few video clips. Ah, perfect, perfecto. Okay, so I'm gonna share three more uh, stories with you and I'm also gonna show you some uh, short clips of uh, videos that I have uh, directed about these stories. So the first case is about uh, recyclers and waste pickers uh, around the world who are increasingly organizing themselves. And uh, actually what's been happening is that um, in the past, most ecological conflicts about waste were about communities being contaminated by waste. But today, now in a, in a more full world, waste is increasingly being recognized as a resource. So a lot of, uh, there's a lot of corporate interest 
uh, that they want to use the waste. And of course, there's also uh, carbon development, CDM, and different uh, subsidies for creating waste energy and incineration plants. So that's leading to uh, dispossession of the livelihoods of these recyclers who are, have been very, very efficient at recycling in, uh, in many urban cities. So I'll play you a two minute video. Oh. This study was called uh, Cooling Agents. And we showed that just the waste recyclers in Delhi alone, they saved over three times more greenhouse gases compared to any CDM waste project in India. But the tragedy is that the waste recyclers are never going to get carbon credits. They're not getting rewards for their work. Instead, they're getting thrown out for doing their work. And what are they being replaced by? By these kinds of technologies. There are many alternatives to incineration, biogas, compost, community management of waste, that make more environmental, social and economic sense. But they provide less returns for those hoping to profit off of climate change. The corporations are not letting societies manage their own waste. If societies manage the waste, then they will do it in a decentralized way. They will recycle it, they will compost it. And then there will be material recovery. In the case of waste management, the route forward is not energy generation, but material recovery. So I think it is insane on the part of the corporations to distort waste management beyond repair. In my opinion... Oh. Okay. Uh, the second example I would like to share with you is how uh, this sort of resistance is also leading to new forms of popular democracy, new forms of governance, and new forms of organization at the community level. And actually, through resistance, communities often get involved in new forms of collective action. And this leads to new forms of organization. And uh, th what this uh, map shows is actually actually uh, the organization of uh, public referendums against mining in different locations around uh, South America. And this is something that began in uh, Tambo Grande, Peru, in 2002. And it's later uh, diffused as a sort of resistance tactic against mining to uh, now well over 100 locations across the continent and also in the US and uh, and Canada. And many of these territories have now declared themselves mining free zones and they have been able to stop mining projects in their territories. So there's a lot of victories, by the way, in the Atlas, I think about 20% uh, of the cases have been termed victories for environmental justice uh, with different meanings in different, in different cases. And you can see here in um, Tolima, Colombia, they've actually turned the resistance against mining into a carnival. And this year it's, it's, gone, it's going global, this carnival. So it will be a global carnival against mining. And, oh, ah, okay, I, I lost one. 
I lost one slide, but I'll share the news with you, is that uh, one of the biggest victories recently has been a ban on all metal mining in El Salvador. And El Salvador has uh, officially decided que el agua vale más que oro, that water is worth more than gold, and uh, they uh, have no more metal mining. And this all stems from one local conflict involving, again, a Canadian mining company, uh, where four activists were killed, and it actually went, uh, there was an international uh, trial when, when El Salvador suspended the company, the, the, the project, the company tried to sue them, I think, for about 26 billion dollars in uh, the international courts, and they ended up losing, but this convinced them that uh, they would rather have a national ban against metal mining. So uh, we'll see how that further develops and whether other countries follow suit. And uh, finally, the third example of uh, resistances that I'd like to share with you is what uh, Naomi Klein has termed blockadia. And this is a global movement for leaving oil and other fossil fuels in the soil, leave oil, oil, leave, uh, oil in the soil, leave coal in the hole, leave gas under the grass. And um, we, uh, you might have seen that there's been numerous uh, resistances also against pipeline construction. For example, recently the Dakota Access Pipeline. And uh, this case, I'll share with you one further video. It's about uh, an indigenous community in Canada that uh, decided to reoccupy their traditional uh, sovereign land that has never been ceded to Canada. And they decided to build an action camp and a healing center on the pathway of seven pipelines. Uh, these pipelines are uh, trying to bring gas from uh, fracking fields in the west of BC and also bringing oil from the tar sands, a uh, very, very dirty oil, we might say, and trying to get these resources to Asian markets, which uh, so far has been a bit of a bottleneck until the present. There hasn't been any way to unlock the tar sands and get this oil to Asia. Um, and they say that if that happens, it will be game over for the climate. So this community has um, put in place their own form of free prior and informed consent and are reclaiming their sovereignty on the territory. According to Wet'suwet'en <laughs> law, we're doing what our ancestors would have done. You know, we're living on our lands, we're occupying them and we're protecting them. So to us, Wet'suwet'en law supersedes Western law because Western law is based on state governments who have assumed that they have the right to make laws on lands that they're trespassing on. So those laws, in our view, are illegitimate. Natural law to us is different. Nature teaches us how to live. Nature tells us what its law is. Natural law is um, when the butterflies return, so do the spring salmon. They're indicators. We follow the season around. As foods are available to us, that's when we take them. Uh, an animal may give its life to us, and we honor that animal by taking it. We dishonor it if we don't take it. We, weren't, we didn't help it fulfill its role. We wait for the salmon to swim up the stream to come to us. We don't send big ships out to deep sea and take all the fish. For the defense of his lands and waters, the relationship we have with our surroundings, thank you for this food, the hands that prepared it, and all those who labored so that we may eat. We uh, ask that you put a blessing on the animal who gave us life for, for our sustenance. We also thank the Creator for our space, our uh, protocols, our laws. And so natural law, ancestral law, it's just basically nature taught us how to live. And it's not a rights-based, it's not man-made. You know, if you travel into the territory here now, you're going to run into a lot of um, mother bears with their babies, grizzly bears and black bears. 
feeding their babies on a land we're one with them all and if they can't fight the oppressive regime of colonialism then we'll do it for them okay so uh, that brings us to the conclusion of this uh, presentation and um, yeah I um, I've tried to highlight throughout this talk some of the more place-based stories and the social issues that are behind some of this uh, when we talk about ecological limits. So it's, uh, you know, it can also become, it can also often become very technical. You know, we say uh, we have to stay below two degrees. We have to stay below 350 parts per minute. We're using terms like the uh, Anthropocene that makes us seem like we're kind of all equally responsible for this ecological devastation. But um, other indicators uh, that are important for me, for example, is that uh, according to Global Witness, uh, three environmental defenders are being killed every single week. And actually this shows, uh, that was the figure for 2016, and every year it's increasing. And actually this shows that these uh, movements, this environmental justice movement, is a real threat to capitalism. So it is actually uh, putting forward other visions that have the potential, I feel, to be uh, radical and, and revolutionary. And uh, what I'm actually arguing for is to uh, listen more to the forms of knowledge and these proposals that are being put forward. And this is including, um, you know, perhaps they're not talking about degrowth. Uh, that's a proposal that's very much coming from the north. But there's, uh, they are expressing in their own ways different forms of worldviews, uh, forms of talking about uh, democracy, sovereignty, the rights of nature, claims for the ecological debt, and basically for the decommodification of, uh, of life. So if we... Uh, return to this idea of the, the bet, I mean, we can think about what are the, what are we betting and who's actually, who stands to lose what in this bet? Um, and I think it's, it's useful to think in these more global terms. Thank you. Oh, and... Oh, and here, um, here's the links to uh, the EJ Atlas and also uh, to this new project that I mentioned that's called Acknowledge, Activist Academic Co-Production of Knowledge for Environmental Justice, where we're also really looking at uh, questions of social transformation towards sustainability and the alternatives that are coming up. Thank you. Hello, my name is Fiona. Uh -huh. and, uh, ah, en castellano, vale. Eh, ¿Tú lo entiendes? Sí, sí, sí. Ah, vale. <risa> eh, gracias por tu charla. Eh, la verdad que te voy a preguntar una tontería, pero creo que es relevante. El artista, el, la obra que nos has mostrado, de alto valor simbólico, yeah. nos has dicho, es de un artista indígena y yo tengo mucha curiosidad por saber su nombre uh -huh. porque si no caemos en los estereotipos de siempre, de que como ella es indígena no hace falta saber su nombre <risa> ¿vale? Cierto. vale, nada más <risa> bueno, su nombre, que lo tenía, tenía previsto decirlo, pero gracias por recordarme es Lawrence Paul Yuxuelupton eh, y tiene una exposición que recién estaba en Canadá, que se llama Unceded Territories. Sí. Hola. Aquí. Hola. Oh, okay. <risa> bueno, es un poco difícil para mí hacer una pregunta, porque realmente todo lo que pueda decir después de haber escuchado lo que escuché esta tarde, solo lo puedo decir desde un estado de mucho dolor y de mucha rabia. Por lo tanto... Me excuso de antemano porque no es lo correcto. De las pocas notas que tomé durante la tarde, una dice recicla tu luz, apaga tu episteme. 
Y la segunda dice aborto, eutanasia y suicidio. <risa> porque es, es, es complicado el tema, ¿no? Es complicado sobre todo porque agradezco de tu presentación haber contextualizado un poco el, el, el espacio del extractivismo que es una cuestión que en, mucho, en muchas conversaciones como que se tendiera a perder y con lo mismo se tienden a perder un, una serie de procesos coloniales que realmente han sido muy determinantes en las prácticas de la explotación que, que nos rodean, digamos. Eh, me llamó la atención tu alusión a los trabajos informales de los recolectores de, de basura. Eh, en Barcelona ese trabajo... Hay mucha gente que lo realiza, pero es gente indocumentada. Es la misma gente de los lugares que siguen haciendo históricamente el, el trabajo de la gestión de los residuos, sean epistémicos o materiales. ¿no? Y por lo tanto también me dio eh, a pensar eh, la, en la necesidad de atacar directamente a la gestión oficial de los residuos, o sea, eh, pensar en cargarse las políticas públicas de gestión de residuos y legalizar al menos a toda la gente ilegal que se preocupa de eh, hacer esa gestión de residuos. También creo que un, un genocidio general de los espacios del norte provocaría una forzosa migración hacia el sur y por lo tanto quizás todo el mundo podría tener la experiencia de, de, de la gestión informal de los residuos. Eh, y me sigue pareciendo un tema, un poco, un, un asunto un poco extractivista, aludir a estas prácticas de resistencia del sur como la solución, porque sigue habiendo ahí una, una constante práctica de volver a sacar de ahí lo que nos va a dar la idea de cómo resolver aquí. ¿no? Uh -huh. Es curioso estar en un, en un museo viendo cómo en Centroamérica, Latinoamérica, eh, África o India están dándonos pistas de cómo resolver, ¿no? Te quería preguntar por el tema de las ONG medioambientalistas, que creo que tienen mucho que ver en este tema y que también me parece que son prácticas de la, son, son digamos como una continuidad de las mismas lógicas extractivistas que, eh, bueno, que, que han hecho que todo esté como está. ¿no? Y, y, y lo siento como por la, por el, eh, por la rabia, ¿no? Pero en general sí que en un momento pensé que había que directamente eliminar ciertos espacios del mundo, del planeta, eh, hacerlos estallar y que eso podría ser una posible solución más rápida y, y que no se gastaran tantos recursos en centros de investigación, en gestión de, en gestión de residuos, etc. ¿Sí respondo? Gracias. Eh, bueno... Primero, eh, referente a lo del Museo de Resistencias en el Sur, eh, bueno, tal vez ha parecido así, pero de hecho, eh, en el Atlas de Justicia Ambiental tenemos casos, hay muchísimos casos también en el norte, y de hecho, el, el movimiento de justicia ambiental empieza en, en Estados Unidos. Entonces, no diría que es se puede hacer esta división tan clara entre el norte y el sur. Como he dicho, en, en todos los lugares hay gente marginalizada, pero eh, sí que creo que muchas veces estas alternativas y visiones salen de la gente que son perjudicados dentro del propio sistema y son marginalizados y sí que hay que escuchar más a estos voces. Así que ¿no? todos estos casos, por ejemplo, de Canadá, eh, Canadá es un país industrializada, es de los más ricos en el mundo, pero tiene muchos espacios que siguen colonizados. Y también ¿no? en Europa, por ejemplo, hay movimientos por decrecimiento contra lo, estas mega infraestructuras que están cuestionando eh, ¿no? qué tipo de modelo queremos. Eh, conocen, por ejemplo, hay ejemplos que uso en otras charlas, no hoy, eh, del ZAD, ¿no? el Zona de Fond en Francia, que está como un experimento social enorme o en Italia contra el um, tren de alta velocidad que hace ya 20 años que están resistiendo a esta idea de siempre todo tiene que, que, que ir más rápido. Así que en ese sentido. 
Y también en los eh, bueno, ONGs medioambientales, yo creo que también es importante no, no decir que hay un medioambientalismo. Eso es otro argumento, porque hoy día hay muchos que vienen y dicen ah, estoy en contra de los ambientalistas porque lo único que les importa es el carbón. Han dicho ¿no? que eh, es lo único que, que es importante, pero hay otros ambientalismos. Entonces hay organizaciones de justicia ambiental que sí están apoyando estos movimientos pero claro, hay también esto del green grabbing, del acaparamiento verde, que van ¿no? de conservación y el enfoque en el carbón. Sí que hay muchos culpables que son ONGs, esto es, es seguro. Y eh, claro, tenemos también documentados muchos conflictos de, de este tipo. Y la rabia está bien, depende de lo que haces con esto. Sí, no, hay que usar la rabia. Es. Hola, a mí me ha parecido interesante tu charla porque nos pone en una contradicción, ¿no? Porque eh, si va a haber problemas para... Si con las energías renovables no vamos a producir ni solo un porcentaje de la energía que estamos consumiendo, uh -huh. eh, el que haya una parte de las luchas ambientales que sea incluso contra energías renovables pone una contradicción y, y claro, te das cuenta de que tú no tienes derecho a cargar tu consumo eléctrico en, una, en arrasar un espacio para llenarlo de plantas solares o de, o de molinos de viento. Pero creo que hay que ser coherente, ¿no? En, en, lo digo para desligar, o sea, que hay un abanico de, de grises, ¿no? Y, y, y no creo que sea coherente luchar en, el, en un país del norte, en una zona rica contra molinos de viento, porque estropea el paisaje si tú tienes secadora o probablemente solo lavadora eléctrica. Entonces, o sea, no, no, no estoy en contra de tu punto de vista, digo que, que, que te pone una contradicción de coherencia de que te, te, tenemos que bajar el consumo, porque claro, no, no podemos obligar a los demás con una, una, una pie en el cuello a que asuman en megaproyectos para el consumo de todos cuando se debería reducir. Um. Bueno, eso, eso no, 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 no es que digo o no estoy diciendo que estamos en contra de energías renovables. La historia se usa para mostrar que cada forma de energía tiene sus costes y tiene sus costes sociales. Es un tema que también se han apuntado los otros presentadores, ¿no? ¿Cuáles son los otros costes? Y también si pensamos en la extracción de litio o otras formas de minerías, no se ha hablado de estos costes ambientales, pero sí que están. Y no, ¿cuál va a ser la reacción social? Aún no lo sabemos. Pero el... Y sabes, también en Cataluña, no sé si saben, ha habido, eh, y está en el Atlas, ha habido eh, muchas resistencias a la energía eólica en zonas de Cataluña. Y están en contra del modelo, porque ellos viven en una zona rural y esa energía se va a Barcelona. Y ellos preguntan, ¿por qué nosotros tenemos que sufrir? Nosotros no queremos esta energía para alimentar siempre más a la ciudad. Y no se puede, no les puedo, no se puede decir a ellos que eh, no tienen el derecho también de manifestar o de estar en contra del modelo. Depende un poco de de cómo construyen su, sus argumentos, de ¿no? qué es el modelo que, que es, quieren poner ellos mismos. Entonces, si queremos realmente luchar por otro tipo de sistema productiva más radical, eh, no 
no, puede, no podemos pensar en eh, reciclar un poquitín más para que se estira un poco más el, el modelo. Esto, eh, no, tal vez vamos a tener, como dices, unos pocos años más de, de materiales, pero tenemos que pensar de manera, eh, no, de cómo más radicalmente, cómo vamos a cambiar el sistema de producción para que no tengo que cambiar mi computadora, es ridículo. ¿Por qué necesito un nuevo? ¿Puedo cambiar un chip o algo? Es como, <risa> hay muchas, hay muchas, yo creo que es como forzar un poco eh, de ser más imaginativos en las posibilidades de cambios que existen, que tal vez dentro del modelo capitalista eh, no es fácil de verlos, pero creo que, que están. Así que todos esos movimientos de resistencia muestran un poco estos conflictos, porque ahora ya podemos decir que es poco, que hay unos pocos molinos en el campo y no pasa nada. Pero esta idea que el consumo energético puede seguir a la misma tasa y vamos a convertir todo en renovables, eh, es ridículo. Es como hemos dicho, como cuántas, cuántas comunidades se van a inudir para, para las represas. No, no es una solución así que podemos ofrecer fácilmente. A mí se me ocurre que es una lucha que tiene muchos frentes y hoy hemos visto tres aproximaciones, o sea, tres, eh, tres frentes por lo, por, en los que se lucha y que lo importante es, que es ver todos los frentes en los que se lucha y que estén bien coordinados. O sea, que el resultado final es de la coordinación de muchos frentes y cada uno tiene sus contradicciones, tiene sus, pero entre todos hemos de conseguir algo. Sí, gracias. Sí, hay como se hace, bueno, se hace un, una distinción cuando se habla de reformas. Hay un, un escritor que se llama André Gortz. Y él hace la distinción entre ¿no? eh, reformas reformistas y reformas no reformistas. Y que las reformas no reformistas pueden abrir eh, un hueco hasta una eventual reforma más revolucionaria. Entonces, eh, bueno, yo puedo criticar energías renovables hasta un punto en frente de de vosotros, pero el otro día eh, mi compañero, él es también economista ecológica, iba a hacer un, una entrevista por la prensa y iba a criticar a las energías renovables, a la energía solar en particular, y que el, comunidades indígenas se están convirtiendo a energía solar. Les iba a criticar porque, como se ha mencionado, Energía solar tiene un muy, en el norte por lo menos, tiene un muy bajo retorno de energía. Así que eh, la energía se está usando en otro, en otro lugar, eh, lo más probablemente en China, donde se produce, no son muy eficientes. Eh, él lo iba a criticar y yo he dicho, pero no, no les puedes criticar, porque esto así la prensa va a pensar que estamos en contra de energías renovables y este tal vez no es la solución a la soberanía energética, no lo es, porque no lo produces eh, localmente, pero este puede ser como una puerta hasta un eventual cambio de modelo energético. Así que como científicos también tenemos que siempre ser muy conscientes de cómo se va a usar nuestra ciencia y no quién lo va a utilizar, de qué manera. Así. Gracias.
Gracias. Ah. Ah, gracias.